Good afternoon. This is the Sarasota Technology User Group and the Central Florida Computer Society, Windows Special Interest Group, or Windows SIG, for February 18th, 2024. I'm Huey Poplock. We've got uh, a, a good group already. We're just getting started for the day, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. Okay, uh, before we start, I do want to explain, I've been having an issue with my Zoom meetings only, and in Zoom, I would freeze up. I'm not sure if I fixed it or not. We'll find out today. What I have done is I created a new user on my computer, on my Windows computer. Uh, as I installed programs in the uh administrator or the main user on this computer. Sometimes I said, uh, install for all users, and sometimes I didn't. So the ones that I said, install for all users, they actually showed up when I uh, created this new user. Not all of them are there, but a lot of them are. So I may not have accomplished what I wanted to, uh, but I'm hoping uh, uh, at least uh, the startup and, and so on uh, uh, works on this, but uh, I've added Zoom, I've uh, uh, done a few other things, and I've got, uh, I, I'm ready to do it today. Uh, we're using this new user, and it's something that you can do very easily in your Windows or on your Windows computer by uh, just going into your setup and adding a new user account. It does not access your hard drive files and folders that are available in your main account. It creates its own. And so I've had to work around a little bit of moving stuff back and forth. So I don't have access to everything. So you may see that if I want to try to do something or show something, I may not be able to because I don't have it set up for that. But I did want you to note that uh, uh, hopefully I'm not going to freeze up today. Uh, even though it's raining and a little bit chilly here, um, it's not going to be freezing anyway, hopefully. So uh, uh, to get started today, what I will do is since I have not, uh, I have installed Zoom, but I don't, uh, I'm sorry, not Zoom, but I haven't installed uh, other browsers, but I did notice that Chrome is installed, which I was thinking it would not be. But let's see, uh, I want to share my screen. And let's see, share the sound in case I need it. And you should see my screen. And you're seeing the normal logo on a new install of Windows. You'll also see that I only have a handful of uh, icons. I have not deleted ones that I don't want uh, to have showing, but I can do that. I've not spent a lot of time setting this up. But what I am going to do is open up my browser, the one that comes with Windows, which is Edge. And I am on the WinSig website where I list all of the items that we're going to try to cover today and links to those articles. So you can go to Huey.net and then click on the WinSig button at the top and it will take you to the page where all of these items are with links. So if we don't get to all of them today, you can still go back and, and look at the others. Or if you have some questions or you want to look at that article a little bit more, you can go back to it very easily. So let's get started uh, with Microsoft's new OneDrive. And because we are in, uh, uh, let's see, I am sharing. Oh, I got to move this over to the other side to get it out of the way. Hang on one moment to make sure this is going to work. Yes, it is. Good. And uh, so now I can see my screen and probably a little black window disappeared or gray window. Anyway, uh, this is, so we want to go to the immersive reader. And this is the article, Microsoft's new OneDrive design starts rolling out for consumers. I haven't noticed if I've got it or not, 
uh, have not paid much attention to it. Microsoft's new OneDrive design starts rolling out for consumers. Uh, they're getting access to the new OneDrive UI or user interface by the end of February. Uh, let's see. And this is what it's going to look like. And Microsoft is starting to roll out a new design for its OneDrive cloud storage service for consumers. The software maker first unveiled a fluent design refresh for OneDrive last year, and it'll be available uh, to all OneDrive personal users by the end of this month. Uh, it's both a visual and functional upgrade designed to help you get to your files quickly and keep your content organized in multiple ways. Uh, according to Microsoft, the improved visual design reduces clutter and distractions, allowing you to focus on what's important, your content. In other words, if you're used to the way uh, OneDrive looked, it's going to be confusing now. Uh, the new visual interface for OneDrive more closely matches Windows 11 and changes to Microsoft's various uh, Office apps. While the main interface has been simplified and modernized, there's also a, a new people view, so you can find files and documents by looking at faces of family or friends with whom you regularly share documents. Uh, and this art, this article's uh, author says, I often remember who shared a spreadsheet with me, but I can never remember the exact name of the file in a long list. So this interface will be super useful to me personally. Uh, Microsoft has also added new file filters to this updated OneDrive UI, so you can filter the interface by Word, Excel, PowerPoint, or PDF files. The new uh, add new button now includes options for both file uploads and new document creations using Office apps. It's much better than the two separate buttons that existed in OneDrive for file uploads and new folders documents. There are many more changes planned for OneDrive and in particular business users. Microsoft is adding offline support and uh, let's go ahead and stop the share for a moment and Talk about this. Has anyone uh, seen and used the new OneDrive, or is there anyone who is is not does not use OneDrive, and why? Harmon, you got your thumbs up, so you use it, I guess. Uh, Jalen? Yeah, I'm not sure. It looks different to me if I go to OneDrive.com. I haven't downloaded a new version of it yet. Um. But it doesn't look, it looks cleaner and less cluttered if I go to OneDrive.com right now. Yeah, and that's and what I they're saying it's going to look like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So not bad. And you can change the, you can change the look. You can go from uh, icons to um, a compact list to a detailed list. So you can do that. Um, it looks, yeah, it's not, uh, it's empty recycle bin. You got my files it's got a for you at the top um for like recent stuff and then yeah there's all my folders so it doesn't i mean and it looks like i say it does look less cluttered okay tony you have your hand up yes i've received a notice that my OneDrive free one is going to expire in may that i need to uh join up and send them some money it's only a couple bucks a month, but uh, I thought that the free one was going to, it's full anyway, so I got to get more space, but I didn't know it was going to expire. Did you know about that? I am not familiar with that. Mm -hmm. I think you do get uh, a certain amount of space for free. I would be careful of that link. If there is a link and if it's an email and a link, I would be suspicious of it. No, not an email. It's a, it's a pop up down in the lower right corner, and it Again, seems to go to the three sixty five page. I so, would still still check with Microsoft directly without clicking on anything uh, and yeah. seeing if, if if that's the case. Good idea. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Let's go back to. Our screen. And uh, we'll close this. 
and go to the next article. Windows 11 will soon no longer boot on PCs that are too old to boot it. So that kind of goes into the uh, little discussion we had before the session started. And let's go ahead and click on Immersive Reader. Windows 11 will soon no longer boot on PCs. Uh, the next version of Windows 11 will now require a POP CNT CPU instruction. Uh, this means old, super old PCs that were already unsupported by Windows 11 will no longer be able to boot the OS. That would be Windows 11 now. Uh, this change doesn't affect modern unsupported PCs released in the last 15 years. Uh, so it's a little bit confusing which ones are going to have a problem. PCs with very old CPUs are going to be in for a rough time this fall when the next version of Windows 11 rolls around as version 24H2 uh, will be the first to no longer boot on CPUs without the POP CNT or population count instruction. This means PCs that are over 15 years old and couldn't officially run Windows 11 before, now definitely won't be able to. Now, it doesn't mean, I guess, in Windows 10, it will still boot. It just won't boot if you install Windows 11 on it. Uh, specifically, the next version of Windows 11 now requires a CPU instruction called POPCNT, or Population Count, which became standard on CPUs in the mid-2000s, uh, that would be like 2015 and up, uh, with AMD's Barcelona architecture, followed by Intel's first-gen Core i-series CPUs. This means pretty much all PCs in the last 15 years won't be affected by this change. So uh, uh, that said, there are still some people out there using PCs with an Intel Core 2 Duo and some of those PCs have definitely been running Windows 11 unofficially. Up until now, those PCs have been able to run Windows 11, albeit very slowly. But starting with version 24H2, the OS will simply no longer boot. So that's a warning to you if you fall into, into that category. Uh, this change doesn't affect more modern PCs that are also unsupported by Windows 11 such as those powered by Intel 7th Gen or Amazon Ryzen 1000 series chips. So if you've been sneakily running Windows 11 on a slightly older PC, you should still be good to upgrade to version 24H2 when it rolls around this fall. And we'll see on the, on the computer that I have uh, on that Dell. Uh, the next version of Windows 11 is set to be a major OS upgrade. We're going to talk more about that in some uh, upcoming articles. Uh, let's see. Next Windows 11 feature update reportedly lands in less than a month, and it's not 24H2. Now, this article is newer than uh, uh, some below. I just added this in a couple of other articles uh, actually last night so that uh, they may not be in order that I would normally have them. Next Windows 11 feature update reportedly lands this month, and Microsoft's release of uh, features on the Windows 11 is starkly, starkly different from that in Windows 10. The company now delivers a gradual rollout every few months. The updates are internally known as moments, and this is also the general uh, fans uh, that the general fans and enthusiasts of the OS refer to them as. Microsoft delivered the last Moment update back in September of 2023 when it released Moment 4 for Windows 11 22H2. While version 22H2 had multiple Moment updates, the Windows 11 23H2 will reportedly, however, only have one such update with Moment 5. And according to a report by Windows Central, the feature update lands later this month on February 27th. The Windows 11 23H2 in itself was not a major update over what we had with 22H2. Uh, and it was mostly built atop an earlier Windows version. 
users only needed to download and install it via uh, an uh, enablement package. Uh, it also looks like it's going to be similar affair with Moment 5 as well. Users should not be expecting to see many new features with Moment 5. You can learn a bit more about these changes in an article if you click on the link. Uh, you can expect uh, a lot more oomph from uh, the next major feature update, which is expected to be in the form of version 24H2 and is purportedly arriving in the to the general public in September of 2024. So uh, uh, we're going to get some updates, but they're not going to be major. And you may not uh, uh, notice a lot of difference. Uh, let's see the next article. Uh, Windows 11 will soon support USB version 2. Okay, what is version 2 of USB Microsoft started testing support for 80 gigabits transfer speeds on Windows 11 through USB. Support for USB 80 gigabits per second will first ship with select systems with Intel Core 14th generation HX series mobile processors. The change between rolling out with Windows 11 build 23615 which became available to the Dev Channel Insiders late last week. Uh, Microsoft shipped uh, Windows 11 build in a, in a number 23615 to Insiders and so on. But uh, let's see, uh, uh, the build uh, made headlines uh, due to controversial addition that has Copilot opening automatically when Windows starts on widescreen devices. But that anger in inducing test of the new copilot default wasn't the only thing to ship with build uh, with that build microsoft also added support for usb transfer speeds of up to 80 gigabits that bump in transfer speed support will bring windows 11 in line with usb 4 version 2 also known as usb 80 gigabits per second which is a major update to the latest usb standard usb 4 version 2 is fully backward compatible, so no one has to worry about older accessories failing when attaching to PCs that support the updated standard. Instead, Windows 4 version 2 will bring new capabilities to PCs that support it. And so on. So uh, you can read uh, some articles on it. Uh, what's, what is USB 4 version 2? And it does explain it. Uh, since most of you aren't going to uh, experience it for a while, I'm not going to go into a great detail. I'm not going to go into the details of it. If you're interested, you can read the article. Um, and let's see. Let's uh, do this one, and then we'll take a break, see if there's some comments. So this one is... When Microsoft is bringing yet another Windows 11 feature to Windows 10 users soon. So those of you who are still using Windows 10, you're going to still get some new features. Uh, in a new preview build, a uh, new Windows 10 preview build is rolling out to insiders in the release preview channel. Today's preview uh, build backports Windows 11's new rich weather interface on the lock screen to Windows 10. I bet that's something you've been waiting for. Uh, clicking on the weather interface will open Microsoft Edge and take you to MS to the MSN website for a more detailed breakdown of the weather. Uh, Microsoft, Microsoft is planning to bring a richer weather experience. So it uh, looks like you can find out more about the weather without opening up your computer. Um, see, Microsoft has already announced that it's planning to bring Windows Copilot to Windows 10 users uh, uh, soon, too. Uh, with that, uh, expected to go into testing in the coming weeks. Uh, the writer expects uh, suspects that we'll be seeing more features make its way into Windows 10 over the next year as well. Um, so let's uh, close a few of these out. 
and this one, and we'll stop the share and see if there's some comments. Stephen, you have your hand up. Yes, and I am confused going all the way back to the second article. Maybe it's something I missed. So, so what is a 10 or 12 or 15 year old computer without the special hardware needed to run Windows 11? I, I don't get it. Are there computers that old? And how did they manage to get Windows 11 in the first place? Did they just change out the motherboard? Or, I, I don't get no, it. No, there, there are some some. People have been able to install Windows 11 on some of the older machines. I'm not sure why or how, but it's not supposed to. But uh, I know yeah. uh, Bob, Bob G had uh, one that automatically updated and it was not supposed to support it. I've got uh, several uh, machines. They're running Windows 11, including the machine I'm on right now. Mine is a uh, Core 2 quad processor which will not support the 24h2 but i have other machines that have a core i processor uh yeah. second third fourth gen etc that should be able to uh, uh continue running unsupported 11. if you never ask microsoft for help you can run 11 just as uh, uh, easily as 10. But if you, uh, uh, what you have to do is get a special uh, uh, install version that uh, ignores TPM, ignores some of the other instruction sets, and allows 11 to work like 10. So you didn't make yeah. hardware modifications on that computer. You no, just got the you special. Can Okay, that you can you can download a free utility program that will create a Windows 11 TPM free install. That so that when you you can you can install it on unsupported hardware. Thanks. Good answer. Thank you. But what it's looking like is that some computers, especially those in computers over 15 years old, won't even boot if you do the update. Okay, Tony, you have your yeah, hand up. I mean, yes, I uh, I have a Windows 10. It's not capable of running 11. And I see down in the lower right corner that I have Copilot Preview. And I didn't ask for it. It just showed up there. And it's, uh, it's a 10. Yeah, they're, they're making uh, Copilot available on Windows 10. Apparently already. Yep. Okay, any other comments, questions? So they're not abandoning 10 after all if they're still doing that. So that's encouraging. Yeah. Jolin? Yeah. Um, I discovered that um, the Copilot had been installed in the lower right corner of my uh, taskbar. I don't like it there because that's where I go when I want to show my screen. You can go into taskbar settings and change that if you would rather have show screen in the lower right hand corner as opposed to co-pilot yeah bob g just did a video on that mine still is on the uh it is over on the left it's not moved yet so i'm not sure what causes that an update of some kind obviously yeah but, but i'm up to date so i guess they're, ro they're rolling that out as well okay not and everybody gets it when has there ever been rhyme or reason to any of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Microsoft is famous for that. To the right of the search bar, where uh, to the little search thing, I've got the little wind. Right. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, that's where it would normally be, uh, Murray. It has but been. now they're putting it over on the extreme right of your taskbar. And replacing the show screen button. Oh, but my far right on the is uh, notifications. No, even I to understand. The further, if you even further, if you write, if you click in the very, very corner past notifications, that's show screen. Yeah, it minimizes everything, but you're, and you and can see all of your, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's, oh. uh, yes, Drew? Oh, when I, I was just going to say real quickly, when you're talking, when someone brought up minimization, if you uh, have an app that you want to minimize everything but this one app, you can actually do a thing that they call shake. Grab the grab the te the bar at the top of your app, and slide the app back and forth, left and right, and within a few seconds, all of your other windows will sh minimize. 
Yes, that's a trick. And it works. Okay, let me go. Let's see, go back to sharing here. How are we doing on time? We're good. And let's see. Okay, let's talk about this uh, new 24H2 that's coming out. Again, no one seems to know, but everyone's guessing. So uh, this might not be totally true, but Windows H, uh, uh, 22H2, uh, new features, next-gen AI PCs, and everything we know so far. So Microsoft is currently developing the next major version of Windows, which is expected to ship later this year. And that one article said uh, September, uh, version 24H2 and the uh, 2024 update. Uh, unlike version 23H2 from last year, version 24H2 is expected to be a much larger OS update based on a new version of the Windows platform that brings performance and security improvements along with notable new features and quality of life updates. Additionally, version 24H2 is expected to focus heavily on next generation AI experiences, something Microsoft has been teasing over the last year. Rumors suggest a new advanced co-pilot is on the way that will enhance the Windows uh, UX and AI and machine learning to improve productivity across apps, search, and more. Microsoft is currently testing many of the features that will make up this next release in the Insider Canary channel, uh, as, uh, as we already know about some of the new features coming in this next release. Okay. Uh, release date is targeting September. And... I'm uh, told Microsoft intends to market this release as an AI-centric one, timed with the next generation AI PCs, which we're going to talk about in, in, a, in a little later ar uh, article, that Microsoft has already announced are coming throughout 2024. Uh, and there's some videos that they recommend uh, for you to take a look at. And uh, so all of this is to say that 24H2, won't uh, begin shipping until the second half of 2024. Some next-gen AI PCs will, soon sh will, will begin shipping soon with version 24H2 preloaded as early as June. Uh, however, the version 24H2 update won't be made generally available to existing Windows 11 users until September at the earliest. So this release will be one that powers up next-gen AI PCs some of which have already been announced and will start shipping as soon as next month. These PCs have powerful NPUs. We're going to talk about that, and, and I think it's the next article. That will take advantage of new AI features that haven't been yet announced, although Microsoft has teased them. Uh, Microsoft is planning to deliver even more updates to the Microsoft Copilot for Windows with version 24H2, starting with moving the Copilot button itself to the far right corner. So they apparently have started doing that in, in some cases. This should make it easier to access as users will be able to usually throw their cursor into the corner to open Copilot's interface. There's also a number of new animations that will play over the Copilot icon when a user's, user copies text or an image indicating to the user that Copilot is available to help with content that has just been copied. Hovering over the icon will reveal a small jump list with summarize, explain, and edit options for the content that's currently copied. So it's going to be, there's going to be some neat things. Uh, uh, 24H2 uh, uh, with the dedicated Copilot in Windows uh, setting in the settings app which will let users enable or disable the Copilot user interface from appearing on startup uh, on PCs with large screens, as well as configure that providers and third-party plugins. While not yet testing, word on the rumor mill suggests Microsoft is planning to introduce a more advanced Copilot with, ver with that version 
uh, will utilize next generation AI PCs. It's just giving us more of the same information. And then the snap layouts are going to change. File Explorer is going to change. Uh, good. All the things that we like to use are probably going to change. Uh, the phone link and voice clarity. I wonder if it'll make my my voice not get hoarse. Uh, energy saver and some pseudo. Speaking of my voice, let me clear my throat here. Okay, Windows H2 introduces support for sudo, super user do. Uh, they stole that line. from Linux. <laughs> oh, did they? A command line yeah. first popularized, yeah, on Linux. Sudo uh, for Windows lets users run elevated processes via command line with a number of different configuration op options. In a new window, a new window will open in which elevated command will run uh, with input disabled. The elevated command will run in line with its uh, STDIN, I, I guess it, how I would pronounce it, closed in the window from which you triggered elevation. Uh, if you, uh, you will not be able to interact with the elevated process. And in line, the elevated command will run in line in the window from which you triggered elevation. This mode is most similar to the pseudo experience on other platforms. So lots of changes coming. For those of you who don't like change, I'm sorry, but it yeah, looks like uh, we're, we're in for it. STDN is standard input. Okay. That's, a, that's what it's an abbreviation for. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Before you buy, yeah, here it is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's a long-term Linux term, term that's been used yeah. decades. Okay, let's do this one. Uh, there's a new Power Toy coming available. It's on its way. If you don't use Power Toys, there's a lot of really neat stuff in there. But uh, let's see what this one's going to be. New releases come fairly quickly. Um, Surprisingly, the menu is going to include links to other Power Toys modules. Uh, timeline for development and release is not known, but uh, I'm not sure what it's telling us it's going to do. It's going from strength to strength, and there's always great interest. Okay. There's a new module in the pipeline that will add new file actions entry to the Windows 10 and Windows 11 context menu. From here, you'll be able to choose from various actions to perform on your selected files, such as creating a new folder containing the currently selected file, generating a checksum, and numerous other options. Okay, and let's go to the next. Okay, this was more on 24H2. Um, and 19 insights from Microsoft's future work report. I'm going to skip that. I'll let you cover that. And then before you buy Windows 11 AI PC, here are some things you should consider. And let's see. We don't have in this article, I don't. Oh, there, there it is. Immersive. Okay. One of these, I didn't have an immersive reader option. Before you buy a Windows 11 AI PC in 2024, these are some things you should know. The AI PC hype is building to a fever pitch after CES 2024. But here's the truth. If you're hoping to be blown away by what these computers can do, you need to temper expectations. AI PCs were everywhere at CES, CES 2024 in January. And companies like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm are all touting how great their hardware is at running AI tasks. As Microsoft put it, this is the year of the AI-powered Windows PCs. But since these AI PCs are already on shelves and you can buy them right now, we need to cut through the hype and focus on what you're getting for your money. Spoiler alert, these PCs aren't all they're cracked up to be. And if you're expecting something trans transformative, 
when you buy one at the start of 2024, you're going to be disappointed. They might one day deliver a lot of cool features, just not yet. So let's talk about what's actually going on and why even if you're passionate about generative AI or Gen AI, you should be skipping this wave of AI accelerating chips and tur uh, turning to different hardware entirely, uh, hardware you may already own. Want to stay up to date on Windows and the future of your PCs? Okay, this is just a, an ad. Uh, current AI isn't happening on your computer. Before wrapping your head around de the details here, it's important to realize that what's going on with most current Gen AI tools, when you use Copilot on Windows 11, uh, pull up chat GPT, turn to a, uh, Adobe Firefly to generate images, or interact with similar popular Gen AI tools, the work isn't actually being done on your computer. Instead, all of that processing is happening in a data center somewhere. Incredibly powerful computers are using a lot of resources and electricity to run the AI model and generate an image of a dog having a birthday party or a response to your question. You can do a lot of this locally on your computer, witness open source tools, such as the stable uh, diffusion text to image model or the Llama large learning model. Uh, but to get good results, you generally need a PC with solid processing power. In particular, you need a very fast GP, uh, GPU, a graphics processing unit of the same kind of hardware that people were recently using to mine uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. The dream is a mainstream PC that can run these AI, uh, Gen AI models locally on your own hardware with no data sent to General Processing Center. But not everything is going to start happening on your PC overnight. We're moving toward a more hybrid future uh, where most of the demanding tasks are sent to data centers and simpler tasks that deliver contextual suggestions and help you rewrite that email may uh, take place on your computer. Now, here's what we are talking about earlier today, uh, the promise of neural processing units. We're all talking about AI PCs thanks to recent hardware advances, specifically the addition of a neural processing unit in Intel's newest Meteor Lake chips and recent AMD chips. The promise is that these NPUs are dedicated low power hardware that can locally run Gen AI models and accelerate AI processing. The idea is that soon every PC you buy will have an NPU. They won't use much power so that Gen AI tasks can run in the background even on battery power. PC makers aren't alone here. Do you have a, a Google Pixel 8 or a Pixel 8 Pro phone? Google's Tensor G3 chip does have something similar. In fact, Google says it paves the way for on-device generative AI. In the real world, it enables AI features such as summarizing audio in the recorder app and generating smart replies in the Gboard keyboard. So on a Pixel phone, that hardware does not provide a way to run Google's powerful BARD AI experience locally. It runs a smaller model named Gemini Nano. In the same way, low-powered NPUs on a PC will offer more AI experience on your PC, but they will not let you run Copilot or ChatGPT locally anytime soon. Uh, and then Windows isn't ready for AI PCs yet. So if you're thinking about buying one because you want to buy a new computer, uh, uh, it's not ready yet. Uh, given Microsoft's chatter about how this is the year of the Windows powered AI PCs, thanks to NPUs, you might assume there's a lot you can do right now. If so, you're going to be disappointed. In fact, Microsoft's AI marketing strategy is the perfect example of what's going on. 
Microsoft is pushing a new co-pilot key as part of the AI PC push. That key will launch the same old co-pilot sidebar you can access on other Windows PCs with no extra AI PC features that use that fancy hardware. Maybe that will change in the future. Windows 11 can barely do anything with an NPU at the mo moment. Out of the box, all you get is Windows Studio effects for video and voice meetings, something like blurring your making it seem as if your eyes are looking directly at your camera when they're not. Paul Therott, who has been covering Windows for decades, just reviewed a 2024 version of the HP Spectre X360, a laptop that comes with an NPU. After trying studio effects, he said that he assumes that pushing this work off the CPU and GPU uh, improves general system performance and battery life. However, he says this software is not demonstrably superior uh, quality-wise to the third-party webcam enhancements I've used in review P PCs over the past year, none of which require an NPU. So in other words, Windows Studio Effects, which is the only feature built into Windows 11 that uses an NPU, doesn't deliver anything you couldn't do with traditional webcam tweaking software. So uh, it goes on and gives some more information here. Basically, you can't do much with the NPU uh, and GPUs or the graphics processing units still beat the neural processing units for AI. So the AI PC buying advice for 2024, if you're looking forward to helpful AI features built into Windows, you should wait. Those features won't arrive until late 2024. There may be entirely newer, better AI laptops out by then, or you may just be able to get a great deal on one next Black Friday. So if you really want to run a current AI workload on your PC, you should avoid the NPU hype and get a computer with a powerful graphics processor unit from NVIDIA or perhaps AMD. Uh, the best performance is going to come from a desktop PC with a high-end GPU. You could also go for a laptop with a high-end GPU. Uh, just be prepared to plug it in as you aren't going to get long battery life while crunching these things. And a couple of more paragraphs, and that's the end of it for that article. Let's go ahead and see if, what discussions we have. Uh, so basically, if you go out and, and, and listen to the hype and pick up uh, an AI PC, it's not going to be any benefit to you. Uh, maybe later this year, there'll be newer models, or maybe some of these will, will work better then when there's software to utilize them. Tim? Yeah, <clears throat> Intel is trying to put the NPU chip into a few of the uh, newest uh, uh, chips, but AMD is a little behind them. Uh, it probably will be towards the end of the year before AMD gets uh, a CPU chip with NPU in it. That's why some manufacturers may use a, a independent on the motherboard NPU chip waiting for the next generation of uh, CPU chips uh, to be in volume that they can uh, uh, use just the uh, CPU chips. It's just a case where there's a lot of hype right now. I wouldn't worry about most of this other than if you don't have uh, a Windows 11 machine yet, or you're thinking of getting a new one, I agree with uh, Huey. Hold off until at least towards the end of the year, like Black Friday uh, or Cyber Monday before you uh, do it, and do your homework to make sure what you buy is going to have at least some of what you need for the future. Yeah, if you're buying a, a desktop, and in a desktop, you can put a, a, a better GPU. You can put in an NVIDIA card, a high-end NVIDIA card. They run around uh, with three, $400. They're not cheap. Uh, and, and, and up, as Harmon is, is pointing, 
So that's going to be a, a minimum price, but it gives you the power that you need to run some of these things locally. But most of you are using open uh, uh, open AI's uh, chat GPT, and it's all done on the cloud. You don't need that extra power on your computer yet. Later on, as they start building uh, where you're, you know, for some businesses, they may want to use all of their information, maybe all of their catalog, all of their uh, manuals and so on, and be able to search them locally on their network. Those people are then going to want to uh, get these high-end GPUs and, and AI uh, uh, PCs first, because they're going to be doing a lot of this uh, crunching uh, locally. But yeah. for most most of us, we don't need it. The uh, uh, high end graphics, you're probably talking five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for one card to plug into a old style desktop computer. Uh, uh, it's a case where high end gamers territory is now being invaded by AI for potentially everybody who is interested. Yeah, and this is also why uh, a lot of these AI apps cost a lot of money because they're buying thousands of NVIDIA cards with high-end GPUs on them to to be able to do the crunching that's needed to, to just do a chat GPT, for instance. And that's why some of the costs are quite high because the companies that are uh, creating the apps and and letting you subscribe to them, have to pay huge amounts of money to utilize those or to purchase them. Any other comments? All right, let's get back to uh, some of the items that we're covering here. Share screen. I know for some of you, this is a lot of this stuff is way more than what you really want to know, but this way you're at least getting some some background in it and then you can forget it and just keep it in the back of your head so when you go to buy a new computer you don't get sucked in uh spending a lot more money than you actually need need to spend okay i'll look yeah this was interesting this is scary uh, Outlook is Microsoft's new data collection service. With Microsoft's rollout of the new Outlook for Windows, and I'm not sure what the new window means. I think it's just if you click on something, it opens it up in a new window. So just that's part of this article. Uh, it appears the company has transformed its email app into a tool for targeted advertising. Everyone talks about the privacy washing uh, campaigns of Google and Apple as if they mine your online data to generate advertising revenue. But now it looks like Outlook is no longer simply an email service. It's a data collection mechanism for Microsoft's 772 external partners and an ad delivery system for Microsoft itself. Microsoft shares your data with 772 third parties. Some European users who download uh, the new Outlook for Windows will encounter a model with a troubling disclosure on how Microsoft and several hundred third parties process their data. And it says right here, we and 772 third party processes data to store and access information on your device, develop improved products, personalize ads and content, measure ads and content, and so on. So the window informs users that Microsoft and those 772 third parties use their data for a number of purposes, including store and or access information on the user's device, develop and improve products, personalize ads and content, measure ads and content, derive audience insights, obtain precise geolocation data, and identify users uh, through device scanning. So the latest 
version of Outlook confirms <clears throat> that more of the big tech's profit margins are becoming ever more dependent upon the collection of your personal data. Outlook also prompts you to choose how ads look on your screen, making it clear that advertising is a key part of the deal. Mac users logged into the new Outlook will even encounter ads that appear as inbox messages. Some ads are from Microsoft applications, while others come from third parties selling products. Microsoft's advertising partners, thanks to the EU's general data Pro protection regulation, Europeans are at least informed that a small village of third parties will be able to look at their data. Americans, uh, thanks to their government's refusal to pass privacy legislation, are never even informed that this is happening. In Outlook settings, UK users can explore a list of advertising partners, which shows the disturbing number of ad companies working with Microsoft. These third-party companies call partners carry names such as AdMax and Ads, uh, Adsocracy, something like that. Uh, this is unavailable in the settings for users in the U.S. and Switzerland. To some extent, the new Outlook lets you choose how your data is used but it's not as simple as clicking a single toggle. Depending upon the type of data they collect, use, process, and other factors, including privacy by demand, certain partners rely on your content, while others require you to uh, opt out, reads the preferences pages for users in the UK. Click on each advertising company listed below to view their pr privacy policy and exercise your choices. Not every partner has the same rules. Uh, such policies are usually long, rambling, and not notoriously and notoriously uh, difficult to understand. But for many companies, that's the new idea, or that's the idea. Such policies are intentionally written this way to give companies the maximum freedom to do what they want with your data. That often means selling your personal details to third-party advertisers and data brokers while making it difficult for you to opt out. And uh, uh, New Outlook steals your email password. Uh, Microsoft's integration of Outlook with the cloud services has raised privacy alarm bells. When you use, when you sync third-party email accounts from services like Yahoo or Gmail with the New Outlook, you risk granting Microsoft access to the IMAP and SMTP credentials, emails, contacts, and even uh, uh, events associated with those accounts, according to the German IT blog. Uh, although Microsoft explains that it's possible to switch back to the previous apps at any time, the data will already be stored in the comp uh, by the company. This allows Microsoft to read the emails. And so I'll let you finish reading this article but it's it's scary how much information they collect. Now, is it information specific to you? Not really, but it's it's on things that you do and things that you uh, uh, you know to send you ads that are targeted to you. So uh, uh, there, you know, when cars are collecting information, Microsoft is collecting information, and uh, Google and all these other companies, all that data is out there. Uh, it's scary, but it certainly uh, is not new. Any comments without getting political? It's okay. So I guess you're all scared yes. enough not this way. Okay, yeah. go go ahead. Who is it? Uh, this is Stephanie Nordlinger. Uh, Hi, De Steph. I, I've been using Outlook for a number of years. I now want an alternative. What's a good alternative? You know what? I'm thinking the same thing. Uh, I do know that the uh, from the same people that that have uh, um, Firefox, they have uh, an e email program. What is it, Drew? Um, the major program is called Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Yeah. Thunderbird is distributed with a lot of Linux distributions. 
Um, and then there's an offshoot of Thunderbird that I'm using now called Better Bird, uh, which is also available for all platforms free of charge. Yeah, it does work on Windows. Yes, runs on Windows, Linux, and I believe the Mac. Um, and you can avoid having to use Microsoft's Outlook uh, app with the advertising. My problem is I have emails going back to 1999 in my Outlook, and I can search for them, and I I hate to lose that by going to something else. So you can't import all that to Yahoo, for example. Yeah, we're, we're talking gigabytes and gigabytes of messages. I'm not about to start playing with them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you can... You can transfer them over and keep them where they are for now, and see yeah, and then and then leave the current version, which doesn't do all of the uh, uh, ad stealing, ad information, and uh, yeah, uh, I mean you could leave I Outlook on your computer, uh, leave Outlook on your computer to read those emails that are older, but start reading new mail with the newer app. Yeah, the uh, what I'm understanding though is they're going to force everyone who's using Outlook to the new Outlook somewhere uh, in the near yeah, future. Yeah, my, the the program called Microsoft Mail is going away or has gone away. It's yeah. for some people, and they're getting the new uh, Outlook. Yeah, but also those of us who use Outlook that currently is part of the Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Office uh, is going to go to the new version and we will be forced to go to the new version eventually. Murray, you have your hand up. Yeah, what I've done is I, uh, I, I, I had my uh, our ISP writers, Shaw, and I, my email there was hacked. And I've been switching over to ProtonMail, which uh, seems to be very, very secure. They, their whole emphasis is on security. And of course they don't, uh, sell or collect your data so uh that's one it's a little bit um not quite as easy to use as some of the others but that's what i've been switching to at least for all of my my friends and family i haven't done that for things that have been on on my other accounts but um, that's where i've switching all my sort of private stuff yeah, I do have a Proton Mail account, but I, I do they have an email or an email reader as well, Mike? Uh, can you answer that? Well, they have email. I mean, you can. Yes, yes, they do. And you can import all of your contacts and uh, all of your email that you've stored before into it, for that matter. They don't have that, all the features of Outlook, but they seem to be developing new features, usually one or two major features a year. Yeah, they're, they're fe they're, a lot of features aren't there, that, uh, especially in the free version. And that's what I've got is the free version. Uh, but you also get with it a uh, password manager and uh, uh, several gigabytes yeah. of free storage. Free storage and a VPN. Yeah, yeah and a VPN. The VPN, though, is is not very useful in the free version because uh, I can't, it's too hard to get it to transfer to get me a VPN in North America. And uh, too many sites don't work if it puts your VPN over in Holland or someplace. Okay. To answer Stephanie's question, then uh, Proton Mail would be another email program to uh, add to take a look at. So we're looking at Proton Mail and uh, what was the first one again? Thunderbird. Uh, Thunderbird. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of my friends says that Thunderbird doesn't have a uh, uh, something that goes with your cell phone. Um, it certainly well, works uh, on cell phone. Map is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Thunderbird, um, the oper that program is uh, operating on desktop platforms. For the Android platform, um, there's an application that's been around for a while called Canine Mail, and it's an open source app for the Android platform. And um, Thunderbird actually absorbed uh, the Canine app. And uh, at some point during 2024, it's expected that the Canine Mail app will convert its name to be Thunderbird. Um, it's always, been, I don't know if they'll do that officially, but it's 
unofficially, uh, Thunderbird for Android is the Canine Mail app. Oh, okay. And that's in the Google Play App Store. Drew, what about Apple other than iCloud Mail? Any way to keep privacy? <laughs> Uh, canine mail is only available for Android. Um, I don't know if there's a, th I don't know if Thunderbird has any plans to do an iPhone uh, app. So I've been using the iPhone mail program. Does that mean that, that they're collecting a lot of data as well? That's what I'm wondering, Huey, with iCloud. iCloud mail, anyway. Just... And this, and this is well, there's on Google, so that's suspicious. They say they're not. Well, uh, something yeah. to look yeah. into. Uh, I really like the the email on my iPad because it's all in one. Uh, I see I see four different email addresses in one in one view. Where with uh, Outlook, I have to go to each one separately. Uh, I don't go to each one separately. I have. Four or five of them on the same uh, yeah. vision. Yeah, you, can, you can have a Yahoo on it on your. You can have your. You can look at your Yahoo Mail on the uh, iPhone uh, Mail app. No, I I know that, but what I'm saying is, and and, and Stephanie, I'm not sure if I made it myself clear. Uh, on my Outlook, yes, I have four different accounts in there, but I have to look at each one separately. Are you saying I, that I do not? I do not. I have uh, four AOL accounts and a Gmail account, and I can see them all at the same time. Wow! So I yeah, you use an alias. You can set up an a, alias. A, look for look for what they call a unified inbox. Okay, it, they did away with it at one time when when I first uh, it, at one update, and I was never able to, it actually keeps a separate uh, file for each of my accounts. So it could be because I've had it so long, it's all of the emails are in their own individual boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Look into it, look into setting up an alias and you take all those four into the alias of an Outlook account. Um, okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. We still have some time. So let's go back. To share screen. Let me close a few of these out. So far, it looks like I haven't hung up at all. Is you know, it looks like I'm in sync. I don't fit in the sync, but um, do believe. Yeah, let's. I'm going to skip down a couple and then come back to, and then end up with. Do you still believe in these 19 ridiculous tech myths? But I want to talk about Arc Search. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Arc Search. It's not available on Windows yet. Uh, but let's take a look. This article. There we go. Immersive Reader. Arc Search combines browser search engine, and AI into something new and totally different. Arc Search combines browser, search engine, and AI. I just said that. It's in there twice. Uh, Browse for me is a new search engine, at least if the browser company is right about the future of the internet. Uh, so this is what it looks like. If you buy something, uh, let's see, let's go down here. A few minutes ago, I opened the new Arc Search app and typed, what happened in the Chiefs game? That game, AFC Championship, had just wrapped up. Normally, I Google it, click on the few links, and read about the game that way. But in Arc Search, I typed the query and tapped the Browse for Me button instead. Well, let's take a look at it. And there is what it looks like. So... You type in the question here. It then uh, it says, okay, what happened in the game? And then what you'll get is a picture. And then you'll get some information below like uh, chat GPT would give you. Uh, Arc Search, the new iOS app. It's, uh, right now it's only iOS. 
from the browser company, which has been working on a browser called Arc for the last few years, went to work. It, so it scoured the web, reading six pages, it told me, from Twitter to the New Guardian to USA Today, and returned a bunch of information a few seconds later. I got the headline, Chiefs win. I got the final score, the key play, a notable event, and also uh, uh, that also just said the Chiefs won. A note about uh, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, a bunch of related links, and some more bullet points about the game. Basically, instead of returning a bunch of search queries about the Chiefs game, Arc Search built me a web page about it. And somewhere in there is the browser company's big idea about the future of web browsers. That, uh, that a browser, a search engine, and an AI chatbot and a website aren't different things. They are all just parts of an internet information finder, and they might as well exist in the same app. Arc Search is part of a bigger shift for the Arc Browser 2. The company's mobile app has, until now, been mostly companion app to the desktop a way to access your open tabs and not much else. With Arc starting to roll out to Windows users, the browser company is also getting ready to roll out its cross-platform syncing system called Arc Anywhere and to bring some of these AI-powered features to Arc on either platform. Eventually, CEO Josh Miller says, Arc Search will be just called Arc and will be the company's only mobile app. The Browse for Me feature, uh, future isn't perfect, but it's pretty impressive. When I search what's, Pete's, what's Pete Davidson up to, for instance, it gives me some broad strokes uh, information about his recent film and breakup news, uh, links to his w w Wikipedia page, a couple of new sites, uh, tag pages for Pete Davidson, and then a bunch of information about his recent personal and professional goings on. Like many AI tools, Arc Search isn't great at citing its sources. So I can't completely trust that Davidson and uh, Chase Sui, uh, Sui Wonders actually broke up, but there is a dive deeper section at the bottom with a bunch of links. Most of these links are the same generic stuff like Pete Zav Davidson's net worth Web page and I'm confident isn't right. And there's good stuff stuff here as well. Uh, the system has improved e uh, a lot even in the time I've been testing the app. Uh, so uh, I like the Arc Search browser uh, as a browser too. It's simply it's simple and fast and always opens to an empty search box, which feels right on mobile. It does put the browser company in the middle of a lot of complicated AI discussions. So uh, it's something to look at. Uh, I I put it on my iPad and I've been playing with it a little bit. And I, I signed up for the wait list for Windows. Right now they don't have an Android version and they don't have a Windows version yet. So let's go to the next article, which talks about Arc Search as well to show you what it looks like. This is actually the App Store on uh, uh, in uh, on my iPad. And let's see, let's go ahead and make this bigger. And the key features, auto up keyboard to start searching with fewer taps, always on ad uh, tracker and banner blocking. Uh, Browse for me to summarize many pages at once and find answers faster. Auto archive inactive tabs to keep things tidy and reader mode to minimize distractions. Uh, uh, crafted with heart by your friends at the browser company. Uh, you can download ARC on your desktop, which is when you go there, you just get on a wait list, but it's ARC.net. Learn more about the browser company at the browser uh, browser.company, uh, privacy policy at arcnet slash privacy, and terms of use at start.arc.net slash terms of use. Uh, and as of the 16th, two days ago, uh, version 1.1.0 1 
Uh, thanks for using Arc Search. We have a new version for you dedicated to several bug fixes. Um, this is just some comments. And the uh, author of this article says, I'm in love with this app. Seriously, thank you for creating a simple forward tool, straightforward tool that can be downloaded and used in under a minute. No tedious account set up, no intrusive ads, no subscription pop-ups, and best of all, the app is simple enough to not even need a tutorial. You just type in whatever you wish to search, and a beautiful minimalistic article self-generates that provides more than enough knowledge uh, than what a half hour searching on Google would have taught. I especially appreciate that the app just sticks to what it was designed best for and isn't attempting to execute additional features that aren't as useful. I definitely look forward to seeing what else this company has to offer. So good article and interesting. Again, it's called Arc Search. And uh, if you have a PC, you want to go to the uh, Arc Search uh, page and join the wait list. So when it's available for your Windows machine, you can try it and use it. And if you have an iPhone or an iPad, uh, you can try it now by going to the App Store and just downloading it for free. Uh, let's see if there's any comments about that. Any comments? The one thing about the, the Arc Search, what it's using is exactly what we need to use. Uh, uh, a search, uh, uh, AI, it's all in one, and it makes one page with no ads, no fluff, and it just gives you the information you're looking for. Very well done. And uh, so if you have an iPad or an iPhone, it doesn't cost anything. You might want to try it. No more comments on it. Okay. I thought we might get some discussion going. All right. Let's, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. And let's see. Do you still believe these 19... Uh, ridiculous tech myths. So we'll take a look at these. And let's uh, immersive reader. Fact and fiction frequently collide when it comes to technology we use in our data, uh, daily lives. And here's an article, and it's from uh, PC Mag. There's plenty of fake news floating around. And so well, let's go to the first one. Privacy slash incognito mode is totally private. I think we covered an article about this uh, a few months ago. Uh, do you feel a little safer from spying when you put your web browser of choice into privacy or incognito mode? Well, it helps, but you're still far from 100% privacy or anonymity. Uh, I think mode... Google got caught. I'm sorry? Google got caught collecting information in incognito mode. Yep, there was a, some articles about that. Uh, the mode erases cookies and tracking data after you close a window, but it doesn't stop websites or even your ISP from knowing where you're going. For example, your browser has a unique fingerprint that has nothing to do with files or info, such as cookies, placed uh, by the site. The fingerprint is more like revealing the very DNA of your browser. Sites can do can and do use that. Even if you use a VPN incognito mode, you can't mask all of it. The best solution is to switch to a security-focused browser, such as Brave, or to use the Tor browser, a system that bounces your connections around as you surf. Uh, both can notoriously slow down your internet experience, unfortunately. Uh, some services can even inject false info into your fingerprint to obfuscate uh, who you are. Mm -hmm. So so you might want to look at that. Okay, you are small potatoes and not a target for cybercrime. This is a myth. Why would anyone try to hack you if you got nothing to hide? Hold on. We've got something to hide, namely private personal information, PPI, the kind of data used in identity theft. Having it stolen really can ruin your life. 
If you do any kind of work on governmental websites, your social security number may be used or stored there. Your credit card number is tied to every online shopping spree. It might seem safe, but that kind of private data is going public all the time due to frequent massive data breaches. You may indeed be small potatoes, but that doesn't mean your PPI or your personal information uh, won't be found, sold, and resold to bad actors. And many of the tools doing this are automated. They, they'll scrape for whatever they can use and sell it, hitting as many targets as possible. So one thing you can do to help yourself is to make sure you have a different password for each site and service that you use online. And I know when I say that, a lot of you don't. One thing that you can do to help yourself is to make sure you have a different password for each site and service you use online. It's a giant pain to remember them all, which is why we recommend using a password manager. But if your password is found in one breach, then the bad guys could have access to every account for which you use that single password. Sign up for some ID theft protection and breach monitoring services, and they'll tell you whether your PPI is compromised. Number three in, in myths, Apple, Macs, and iPhones can't get malware. The evil people who write viruses want to infect as many people as possible. That's one reason Windows systems and Android devices are the usual targets. There are just a hell of a lot more of them. But, but simply because you don't hear a lot about Mac OS and iOS attacks, that doesn't mean they don't happen. While the walled garden aspect of Apple's products makes it more difficult for bad actors to load your devices with malware, Sometimes even Apple leaves security holes in its product defenses. Take, for instance, the IOM mobile frame buffer problem of July 2021 that struck iOS, iPod, iPad OS, and even Watch OS. Had it been found by the wrong people and not patched with an update, it could have been an easy exploit. So there's two things you want to do is, is watch for these problems and do your updates. Uh, keep your devices up to date to avoid such issues. And you're far more uh, likely to be infected if you have jailbroken an iPhone or an iPad. But if, if you jailbroke your device, you're probably tech savvy enough to know the risks that go with using apps and software that haven't been vetted. Uh, like those of us who've been using Windows for decades. Number four, artificial intelligence is sentient. Uh, AI as we know it today, many things are incredible achievement even at this early stage, full of biases that are downright embarrassing and legally actionable. Uh, able to hallucinate such things as a dying man in the desert need of water. But AI has not achieved human intelligence. It's not self-aware. It does not have feelings. Uh, Google itself has listed a list of AI myths and it specifically uh, sp and sp says specifically that AIs remain narrow and brittle and lack true agency or creativity. Google will likely stay ahead of the claims of sent sentient AI. The company fired an engineer in the summer of 2022 who publicly claimed that the Lambda language model for dialogue applications chatbot system upon which the Baird AI is built was alive. What Google is saying is that AI didn't decide to write a story or compose a song. You did that. Generative AI, such as Bard, uh, which is now called Gemini, Gemini, uh, ChatGPT, and even Dolly, uh, and the Midjourney for images are fantastic mimics. The AIs simply use patterns to make new, never before seen patterns. Uh, they fed they're fed an enormous amount of data. GPT-4 supposedly has one trillion parameters to build on. The tool will then vomit back something that mashes all of the info together. If you're talented enough to write highly specific prompt describing what you want, that mashed new thing could deliver something beyond 
your expectations, making AI look miraculous. Uh, Alexa is recording everything, myth number five, and then we'll end it with this one. Uh, uh, an Amazon Echo uh, and similar devices such as the Google Home and Apple HomePod are indeed always pa passively listening because if not, the devices wouldn't hear the wake word, which is typically Miss A on an Echo device. Uh, the wake word tells the device to actively listen and help you with a query. You can push a button on top of any uh, Miss A unit to turn off the microphone until you want it on. You could also push the microphone button on top to start your query, but that's not what the smart speakers were designed to do. The images record only what you say after you say the wake word. Uh, they don't record everything. Instead, you turn on something like uh, Miss A guard, a feature ostensibly uh, for listening for suspicious noises like breaking glass while you're away. If even that much listening is too much for you, then go to the uh, mobile app uh, to more and settings and then the privacy and then review voice history to delete one or all of your queries, even just those on certain date ranges. You can also do it from the amazon.com website. You can also say, Alexa, delete everything. Uh-oh. I apparently she didn't hear me. Good. Delete everything I said today. Once you enable that function in the app, best of all, you can set Miss A to never save your recorded voice and even tell it to send improvement data to Amazon ever. So that's the last of those. And it's time for me to switch over and hand the baton. So let me uh, say at this point, thank you very much for joining us. This has been the Windows Special Interest Group or WinSig for Sunday, February 18th, 2024. I'm Huey Poplock. Thanks for joining. 